We're going to now move on to drawing these Lewis structures uh, for covalent compounds. But the best understanding is to go back to what we even brought up back with the nomenclature unit. And that's kind of a breakdown of what we know about um, certain columns. We're going to do one and two, then we jump to group 13. So we jump over the transition metals. Good job. And then we go 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So what we know about this is we know that the um, when we draw an electron dot diagram, we're just going to, again, we're going to show only our advanced electrons, the outermost electrons. We're going to draw dots around my X. And so everything in group one, group one lets us know that we have one advanced electron. And again, that's why we also know that, remember, the full number is a full, everything wants a full octet. And it realizes that, you know, in group one, they realize, well, I can gain seven or lose one. They choose to lose one um in that process so they like to form one bond so they can actually lose one bond they don't want any they will have no lone pairs around them in that process so in group one like hydrogen hydrogen only wants one bond in group two they have now in group two they have two valence electrons Example group two would be beryllium. Um, group two, they have two valence electrons, so they want to form two bonds. So they realize, well, I can gain six or lose two, so it's easier to lose two, so they form two bonds. To lose those two, again, they will have no lone pairs. In group 13, follows suit. In group 13, they have three valence electrons. In group 13, our example here is boron, and it has a number, it will want to form three bonds. You can go form five or three gain five or lose three. Remember the gain or lose you have to form bonds. So basically it's gain five or, or gain three bonds. And they're gonna go always go after the lower number here, which is a little easier. So easier to gain three bonds. And we'll also have no lone pairs. Now these are pretty much set in stone. And so these guys are very, very important that you understand that because these are going to come up um, in exceptions to the octet rule. They understand how many advanced electrons they like to form. Now we know by default um, back in the last unit, you learn by default, every the alpha transition metals have how many valence electrons? By default, there are two valence electrons. So all of our transition metals are going to act like group two. When they have two valence electrons, they want to form two bonds. And that's by default. Now group 14 kind of rides the fence. And this is where our carbon comes into play. And this is where we have organic chemistry uh, revolves around carbon. Because carbon has four valence electrons. And these are all unpaired. And so all of them want to be paired. So they want to form four bonds. That's where we move into organic chemistry. It wants four bonds. It doesn't want lone pairs. It'll take four singles. It'll take two doubles. It'll take a single and a triple. It'll take a double and two singles. It wants four bonds in this process. And it's going to get its four bonds. So whenever you have carbon in a compound, well, another key thing, kind of jumping ahead, when we form these little structures, carbon, whenever we ever have a compound, will always be central. It loves to form four bonds, so it will be central. <clears throat> Group 15 has five advanced electrons. Now, so we, so we go around, we have four, but then we pair up for the first time. So we have one lone pair. We have one lone pair, but we have three unpaired. So if you kind of see the trend here, it's the unpaired electrons are the ones that want to form bonds. So 15 has three unpaired electrons, therefore it likes to form three bonds. Now nitrogen is our example here. Nitrogen loves a triple bond. Now, does it mean it's only going to form three bonds? No, it's not. The only, there's going to be exceptions to the octet exceptions here, but generally what it prefers is forming three bonds and having one lone pair. Group 16, so 1, 2, 3, 4, so now I have 4, but now I have 2 more to go, so I pair up once and I pair up twice. Now I have 2 lone pairs, but I have 2 unpaired electrons, so yes, it wants to form 2 bonds. Oxygen is our example here. So Oxygen loves 2 bonds and 2 lone pairs. That's its preference. Does it mean it always gets it? No. And we're going to find a group 15 and group 16 are also going to fall into our exceptions of the octet rule. And that what happens, those lone pairs can actually separate out and become singles again. And so what we have is expanded octet because if my one lone pair in group 15 separates out, I have five valence electrons. And so it could form five bonds. It gives me a total of 10, not eight. And then for my group 16, those two lone pairs can separate out. That give me six. So it could actually form 12. I end up having 12 um, valence electrons around the central atom. <clears throat> and this is not a full octet. It's expanded octet. So I could have 10. could also go up to 12. Now, group 17 is pretty much set in stone. They have, in this situation, they like, um, they have three lone pairs and they like to form one bond. Is this always so? No, there's always exceptions to the rule again. But generally, you're going to find group 17 just wants to form one bond to acquire their full octet. 
And what's the goal? Everyone wants to become like a noble gas. They want that full octet. They want to reach that point of stability. Um, but again, what we're going to find that noble gases do not like to form bonds, and they like to have four lone pairs. Now, is this always set in stone? No. As our noble gases get larger, and electrons get the valence electrons get further and further away, they can come in contact with something with a high electronegativity and therefore be electrons be torn away from them. Something like with a fluorine, um, with a fluoride, where they bind it with a fluoride and fluoride will actually can cause those um, full, oct uh, full octet to kind of separate out and form bonds. So it is possible when noble gases get larger. But in general, noble gases don't want to form bonds. So here's our Lewis structure rules. Generally, um, again, some general things you must remember here as we go for it go through this first of all. Um, when we deal with covalent compounds, we draw lines between them. We don't leave dots. Remember, you show dots only with your, um, when we do the, the, the um, ionic compounds, we show their um, Lewis dot structure. But with covalent compounds, we use lines to form bonds. Single line, a single bond, two lines, double bond, three lines, triple bond. But then we have to make sure everything has a full octet. Those lone pairs are where we bring in our dots and show that we have a full octet. And also remember, the only electrons that we're focusing on are the valence electrons, which are the outermost electrons. So those are the ones we're dealing with. So here's some general rules as you're going through this. One and two actually go hand in hand, because the first step you need is you have to find out the sum of electrons you have, you're actually working with in the compound. So you have to add up their valence electrons. Um, when you're adding up the valence electrons, if the overall compound has a negative charge, it was negative because it gained. So whatever it's, if it's negative one, you add one. Negative two, you would add two additional. If it's positive, you subtract because positive means a loss. So if it's a positive one, you subtract one from your total. Positive two, you subtract two from your total. So one and two go together because you need a total to start out with. And what I talk about in this situation, I talk about the valence electron store. So in order to know what you can actually spend when you go into a store, you need to know what you have in your pockets. What do you have available to spend? So this is a key and most fundamental step that is, um, is very, very important as you start this process. The rule now, who goes central, is a key aspect. Who likes to, generally the rule is who likes to form the greatest number of bonds. Another one is the least number of elect, least electronegativity, and you have the electronegativity chart. You can actually look at that. Um, and also a third one you could look at, you could look at a ratio. So like if, if it's a maybe a one to three ratio, um, I'm going to put my one in the center and my three around it. So the ratio can also work. And a lot of times the ratio is a quick visual that gives you guidance um, quicker than trying to figure out the, the who likes to form the most bonds and, and the least electronegativity. However, remember carbon loves to form the most bonds. If you go back to the chart, group 14 loves four bonds. So carbon, whenever you see carbon, it will always be central. After you find out who's central, you attach everyone to the central atom using single bonds. Now this is where you have to keep a budget. And this is very, very important as you keep a budget because single bond costs you two electrons. A single bond costs you two electrons. And so it's very, very important as you go through this. <clears throat> After you form your single bonds, then you focus on every, all the atoms on the outside first. And you make sure they have a full octet. Once they have a full octet, then you focus on your central atom. If you have any, if you run into a deficit, means you do not have enough electrons. That's when double and triple bonds come into play. And I'll give you, I'll give you um, some key statements here um, just as we finish out this PowerPoint. Uh, this section of it. Um, if you have any extra electrons left over, and this commonly shows up when you have a larger noble gas that gets involved in the compound, you're going to have extra electrons left over. When you have extra electrons left over, they always go around the central atom. In the end, again, everything should have a full octet. There are some exceptions to the rule. You'll see that you know, your hydrogen, for example, in the end, group one usually wants one, um, one bond, so we don't show its full octet. Group two wants two. Group three wants three. So we don't show a full octet with those ones. Um, so there are exceptions to the rule, but again, everything should be, in general, you're looking for a full octet. So next we move on here and we'll take a look at CH4. CH4 is methane. And the first step here, again, like I told you, is you must figure out your budget. How much do you have to spend? Well, carbon is in group 14, brings us four valence electrons. Hydrogen group is in group one, has one by a total of four of them. So I have a total of eight valence electrons I have to spend. Next situation, who's going to go central? So my carbon um, loves to form the most bonds, I'm going to put it central. And I'm going to attach my four electrons around it, just kind of like a plus sign here. In this situation, so it's equally balanced. This is, ends up being a tetrahedron, tetrahedron, tetrahedral shape. Um, so in this situation, I attach my 
um, four hydrogens around it. Now I had to buy four single bonds. I remember each single bond cost me two electrons. So um, that cost me eight eight dollars or eight electrons. And so I had eight to spend with. I just spent my budget. And you have to spend your budget. That's very, very important. And so you realize then everyone's happy. My hydrogens are happy. One single bond. My carbon is two, four, six, eight. It's also happy. Next, move on to O3, which is ozone. Now, O3, again, o oxygen comes up in group 16, has six valence electrons. I have a total of 18 to spend. So who's going to go central? <clears throat> well, in this situation, again, they're all oxygen, so it doesn't really matter. Oxygen central. Now, as you're going to come up in this situation, though, you're going to realize, though, as you go through this process, that you're going to run short. And you're going to need 20, but you only have 18. And so that's when a double bond comes into play. In this situation, we'd, we'd, I'd ask you to draw out resonant structures because the fact is the double bond could be on either side of the oxygen. So I would draw, have you draw out resonant structures on that one. The third one deals carbon dioxide. Getting carbon to oxygens that have 16 valence electrons, 16 valence electrons to work with, or I'm going into the electron store with $16. However you want to look at it. So I have to spend 16. I can't spend more. I can't spend less. I have to spend 16. So again, in this situation, you're going to realize now you're going to run a deficit of four. You're going to need 20, but you only have 16. So this way you have two options. And this one, you if you run short by four, you make two singles into two doubles, or one single into a triple. And as we go back to the chart, we can actually figure out stability here because we realize, okay, look at a carbon. Carbon doesn't matter if it has two doubles <clears throat> or a single to triple. It has four bonds. It loves four bonds. However, oxygen, what's oxygen's presence or um, preference, excuse me? Oxygen loves two bonds and two lone pairs. So we see that the first one, double, double bonds, is actually more stable. And we'll see that as in our next um, lecture as we talk about formal charge. Now, the next one we have is group four. And now this one, we begin to get a total. We have to realize I had the overall compound, this is one with polyatomics, has a negative two. This is carbonate, has a negative two. That means once I add up my one carbon, my three oxygens, then I have to add an additional two to work with here in the situation. So I actually have 24 electrons to deal with. In this situation, again, you run into a deficit. You're going to need 26, but you only have 24. So the choose choices, you have to make one single into a double. Well, you have three singles to work with. Well, that means then you have to draw out three resonant structures because you have to show visually show that the double bond could be on either one of those triple bonds. Now, the fact is with resonant structures, the fact is that double bond is on all single bonds at the same time. All those bonds are what we actually call hybrid bonds. So, right, I even though we show it as a single and a double, the fact is that they're neither single nor are they double. They're a hybrid bond kind of like our hybrid vehicles. There's a mixture of the gasoline and the electric. It can run out both. And so what we actually form here with our resonant structures, we're forming hybrid bonds. We just have to visualize it on a two-dimensional surface. So that's where we have to draw out resonant structures and show the double bond in either one of the three. Last thing I'll finish out with, and I was talking about this, is just understand these two key rules. It's very, very helpful as you're going through this. If you have a deficit of two, your choice is to make up with a deficit is make a single bond, one single bond into a double bond. That's how you make up a deficit. Remember I told you doubles and triples are when you have run into a deficit. If you have a deficit of four, then make one single into a triple or two singles into a double. You have two choices there. You just have to figure out which one is more stable. That process. Now, the only one's going to show up here is you have a deficit of three. Well, if you have a deficit of three, you don't jump up and follow the deficit of four rule, you drop back and follow the deficit of two rule. And that will show up having a deficit of three.